Oh, it's going to take a moment. No problem. Apparently, I've never done this from this computer before. Um, and I have to give it permissions. You're going to have to let me back into the meeting. I've actually just, OK. Looks good. Did it go full screen? It is. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm Maddie, and here we go. I actually tested this. I probably shouldn't go more than like 10 minutes. Um, and as a disclaimer, I'll actually I'll get to that when I'm done. Um, so my goals for this project were first to learn what makes a good animation portfolio. I'm, uh, I was majoring in new media design and I switched to SOICE, of course, um, and I'm focusing on motion design and minoring in psychology. So I wanted to focus on animation and my portfolio is not up to standard. So that was my goal for this, this project. Um, learn what makes a good animation portfolio and what would get me an internship um, or a job. Decide what work I need to make to improve what I have and create a new updated portfolio website um, and complete at least one animation project to put in it. Um, oh, I can't see. So my plan uh, started with meeting uh, with an old animation professor, and I only got uh, one, I only had one intro to an animation course in new media, um, and had some difficulty with this, uh, the professor after the fact, once the semester picked up, he went AWOL, um, and I was basically on my own, but I had a good premise after two phone calls. Um, he advised that I decide on two projects to complete by the end of the semester between 10 and 20 seconds because I want to focus on frame by frame, which is far more time consuming than other types of animation or marginally more time consuming. Um, lay out the steps of just for my own organizational purposes um, and to get to work. So I had to do a lot of additional research um, and review to do this, including the basics of frame by frame animation and how to, you know, when things move, they stretch and how to display that visually. Um, color theory, lighting and composition, which I haven't really worked with in depth this way, illustrative this way since freshman year. Um, the process of photographing a uh, work for a portfolio and character rigging, which I experimented with because it would speed up the process, but didn't use because I am not skilled enough and that would have taken basically the entire semester. So um, an animation portfolio needs the basics like any other portfolio that are examples of a good use of light, shape, color, composition, the other fundamentals um, with examples of life drawing like still lifes, figure drawing, um, both human and animal and a focus in, uh, in figure drawing, um, which I don't have. Uh, landscape and interior drawing to prove that you can do it and specifically for an animation portfolio character design um, because that's relevant to the field. Um, examples of animation uh, would include walk cycles with those character designs. Um, and I wanted to include short illustration loops um, to demonstrate illustration and include animation. Um, and then a focus, which is also necessary, not just something I wanted. 
Um, so I wanted my focus, want my focus to be a music video. I've had ideas for creating animations to music and animating to time is something that I'm, I'm very, that I like a lot, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. Um, so I set up I, ideas for three projects in case one of them didn't work out and laid out the first one. And it was to a song called Pelican's Wee by Cosmo Sheldrake, which is a poem by someone whose name escapes me. Um, and these, after a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of preliminary work were the character designs that I came up with uh, for two main, it's the king and the queens of the pelicans, we. Um, a skeleton that it would be animated around and a background. That was some of the sketching. And then storyboards, which there were so many iterations of storyboards, which proved uh, that I had another problem because uh, I have no idea about anything related to dance and I wanted to make these pelicans dancing. Um, so I had to choreograph pelicans uh, and there were a lot of versions of that and took a lot of time and confusion. And then the final style test where I had examples of the colors I wanted to use and the way the lines would look and the way the pelicans would work over the skeletons that I made. Um, and this project turned out to be problematic because by week eight, as it says here, I realized that I didn't have the time or the skill set because this uh, the workflow was unfamiliar to me. I had to essentially relearn how to animate because it's been two years since I made a decent animation project. Um, and if I wanted to have a completed project that was something worthy of putting in a portfolio, I wouldn't be able to complete this one by the end of the semester. Um, and it's only 12 seconds long. So to summarize the process of frame by frame animation, it involves blocking out the timing um, to the music, which again, I said is personally very important to me because I think, and generally very important to animation as a rule. Um, yeah, when you know everything moves to the time and I wanted each scene to move to the music. Um, sketching where the characters are gonna be, how they're gonna move, you know, the general, um, doing a more refined sketch over that. So I'd have skeletons uh, and their actual shapes and working on how they'd stretch and how they'd uh, warp with movement, which is a detail kind of unique to frame by frame uh, versus other types of animation like 3D. Um, and then going over each frame with lines so that I'd have an outline to color in. And this was going to be 24 frames per second and I had 12 seconds, which I can't do math in my head, but was something like 400 frames. So I did not, uh, I, I did not realize how long it would take me to get to this stage. Um, yeah. And then of course the background is a whole step all in itself. So this is where this is where I was. This is just the initial sketch stage. King and queens of the pelicans, we know what the birds so grand we see. None but we have feet like pins with lovely leathery throats and chins. And I was going to add a short intro and a short credit sequence where I'd, you know, show off the actual characters a little bit next to some credits. Um, and there were supposed to be two pelicans in the final scene there and one would hit the other one in the head and knock it out and it'd be funny and have something unique because that's also an important consideration in a portfolio. Um, whoop, no, don't play again. Let's go to the next. Ah. So pivot. Um, I'm in another Swiss class. Uh, about the intersection between comics and music and the final project for that that I was already working on uh, am already yeah I had I had work already done for this by the time I realized that I was a little bit screwed for the pelicans project um, and it is about, about the final project for that class is to create 
a comic that goes along to a song. So it's already essentially, you know, I can make a music video. Um, these were some of the initial, yeah, initial ideas, ideation and sketches from two weeks ago. So my plan for this, and I'm a lot further along now actually, um, was is to use each panel as a scene in a music video style animation. And the only thing that will be animated frame by frame is the whale on the final page. And this is six frames a second. So I've, I've updated that to 12 now. It goes a lot smoother. Um, not gonna be 24, but because the whale moves slowly, it'll look nice. Um, yeah. Uh, I will have a project. It won't be the project that I wanted and it won't be two projects like I planned, but I know what I'm capable of for the next two weeks. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at with that. And the portfolio itself is the last piece of this. This was my portfolio before. It was hosted through Adobe because they, if you have, have a subscription to the Creative Cloud, they offer up to five websites or something. Um, but it's not a style that I'm happy with. I, uh, When you review a portfolio, the person reviewing it has an instant impression from the first page that they see. Um, and this is a page of folders and not a page of complete images. And that was a huge problem for me because you click one of these folders and it opens up to uh, the page on the right where all the images are stacked vertically. And this isn't divided very well, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but that wasn't the style that I was looking for. And a lot of the portfolios that I've researched and I've seen um, the ones that are used as examples of here's what a good portfolio looks like, they don't look like this. Um, so I spent a ridiculous amount of time actually digging through old hard drives and finding all of the original files for these all of the things that I wanted to display, um, updating some of them, editing some of them, and trying out three different hosting websites. Uh, and Squarespace has one of the nicest layouts that I could find um, that was the easiest to use and the easiest to update in the future. Um, and I got a 10% discount code, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this one displays as a gallery and I can click or anyone can click any of the images and they open into a full size thing. Um, so this, this is laid out a lot better than the previous one. So I'm a lot happier with this. And now I know what I need to make to put in it, which is actually my plan for the next six months. I have a part-time job and time off to complete this while I apply for jobs and internships and such like. Um, so that is what I've completed. Uh, and I, my, my disclaimer was going to be, I didn't get nearly as much done as I wanted to, but I did learn a lot and I, I know enough to, to move on from here. Um, and that is my presentation. Thank you. And that is exactly the point. You know, we, the point of the course is to learn a lot of stuff that you didn't know before. So it sounds like you succeeded. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, you know, a lot of students find that they, they bite off more than they can chew. And you don't necessarily find that out until, you know, seven, like you said, eighth week or the ninth week or something like that, because things are going along. You never know when there's going to be a hiccup and when the challenge is going to hit, hit, hit hard. But so anyway, so the... Uh, Great presentation, I really enjoyed it. Uh, any, any sort of creative work is, is gonna come across the challenges that, and sometimes you can overcome them and sometimes you just have to pivot, as you say. Well, uh, I was curious as to what, what's with the pelicans. I mean, I like, I like the pelicans better than the whale. <laughs> I don't know if you're gonna go back to the pelicans. I am. Um, I have that project entirely mapped out. I have a whole folder over here of sketches that, you know, that led up to that. Um, all the, that was, that was, you know, eight weeks, essentially six weeks really of constructive work getting to the, the beginning stages. So I have, I have that foundation. I, I will go back and I kind of want to do the whole song 
um, but that's a huge project. Um, I will go back to it, but I, like I said, I realized I didn't have the time and that was just an inexperience kind of thing. Like I, I hadn't remembered just how time consuming uh, frame by frame animation actually is. Uh, so well, you, you said it was based on, I assume it, it, it was based on a, a song that you liked, but then you said yeah. the song was from a poem. Um, Let me. Uh, it is a song called Pelican Chorus by Edward Lear. Um, and the song was, or the, the song, it was a poem by Edward Lear. And the poem. Edward Lear? Edward, Edward Lear, Lear, I will type it. Lear? Yes. Okay, okay. So, right, I know who that is. Okay. The poem was put to music by an artist called Cosmo Sheldrake, and it's got a fun beat, and it's about pelicans. And one of my advisor's uh, more important notes was, you need to have something that makes your portfolio stand out. He liked one of my weirder animations where a fish comes out of a cube and turns into a monster and turns back into a fish and goes back into the cube. That was for a project. And he says, do something weird like that, you know. Um, an anteater playing basketball, you know, something that, you know, they haven't seen that combination of things before. So dancing pelicans was the one of the, I also had a break dancing fly and the, the whales, basically that was the third project. I don't remember what the third project was at all. Um, that would be something that would go along to these songs and also be a little bit different. Um, but the whales is what I have. That was that was the the option that I couldn't start from scratch, um, basically. So that was that was what I have to work with. So so you were you liked the song presumably. That's why you picked it. And yes. did, did you know anything about pelicans? I mean, I mean, how, how did it? How do you how do you know how a pelican dances? I mean, you don't see. That's that's. There is a good beat in the song where I could easily picture, and I, that was that was one of the things. Um, someone going step step, jumping back and step step and jump back, and that repeats through the songs. So I was like, that's an easy dance move, like dance line that I could have these characters do. Um, I really like drawing birds, which I like it a little bit less now. <laughs> um, but that I was like, I'll, I'll enjoy this. I enjoy the song. This is one of the songs that I probably won't hate after listening to clips of it 17,000 times. Um, and then I have a general understanding of bird anatomy and how birds move. And I could simplify them, pelican, enough. Um, I was also thinking about secondary movement and the, the stretching and warping that I mentioned with, with movement. Because if you look at cartoons and stuff when someone's moving really fast or they're having a really animated facial expression you know the whole character's face will stretch um because that's it's part of the style that makes it seem more more realistic kind of like a motion blur kind of thing but you got to do it with the actual lines um that you're drawing which is interesting to me and i was thinking about the pelicans uh pouch bouncing when they nod their head and i was like that would that be kind of cool to animate and it you know that was my idea that the, it would it would look nice and it would be fun and informative and then i realized i didn't have time so sh shouldn't you go and observe pelicans in in the wild and and and, uh, and sort of uh, focus in on exactly what what they're like i watched so many youtube videos throughout the process of this and a lot of them were research videos about like the lighting and the composition of things but so many of them were like clips of documentaries where they talk about pelicans or some okay. yeah some viral video where a pelican eats or tries to eat another pelican's head there's yeah i did do that to an extent yeah okay well i i loved your presentation it, it sounds uh, like you've got a a really good thing going there and i really hope that you can follow it through too because i think it'll be great in a, in a portfolio um Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Maddie, I thought that was fantastic. I have such an appreciation for the, the, the time and patience and effort that you uh, put into not only one, but two and kind of three projects here. Um, so I, 
my question would be, what advice would you give other students that are doing something similar to you? Um, you know, you you reference uh, you reference pivoting, um, which I I think is really important. We know how important that is in life. Um, and um, Stephen talked about just the amount of learning, and um, and I think you learned a lot about yourself, which is yes. and your abilities, which is great. So so what would you recommend to students if you had to give them advice? Have a backup plan. Um, have understand that or. Yeah, figure out how to understand that even though the project isn't, the initial project that you wanted isn't going to get completed, you're still going to gain something from it. And, you know, I, I'm upset that I don't have something more substantial to show for my efforts, but I have a lot uh, in insubstantial to show for the effort that I went through. Um, there was a lot of learning involved and a lot of realizing my own limits. And even if you don't understand your own limits in the beginning, once you get a sense of that, you can reevaluate. And, you know, um, for me, making checklists is very useful. And then take, take time once a week or whenever you work on it to reevaluate what you actually have left to do. Um, because I could have come to that conclusion a week or two earlier if I had sat down and and considered I have 400 frames and if I do an, ex, uh, an example one right now it takes me about 10 minutes um 15 maybe 20 to sketch this individual frame out and put lines over it and that's a number of hours that I don't have to spare um so yeah, have a backup plan. I have difficulty putting that into a single. No, oh, I know, of course you do, absolutely. Um, but I think what you're, uh, what you're talking about is just so much learning happens in setbacks and failing forward and- Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought you did a great job and I don't want us to go too much longer. Um, certainly want to see if anyone else has any questions, but we're already almost at the 430 mark. Um, but are there any questions from anybody else? Okay, then um, thanks, Maddie. And we'll just, uh, we'll move forward with Anna. Awesome, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Um, well, great job, Maddie. That was really fun to watch. I You've disappeared, Anna. Oh, we lost her for a second. Hopefully she'll um, log right back in. Hello. So sorry. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I had my phone um, resting near the screen with my notes on it, and it was leaning on the power button. So accidentally shut my own laptop off. Laptop off. But anyway, I um, hope you all are having a great day. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everyone see that all right? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. That's good. Awesome, thank you. All right, well, hello. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Rose Layden, and the title of my project is You Don't Belong Here, and it's a website that I created to document the hateful incidents that have been happening to the Asian American community since March of last year. So it's essentially an online analysis of the spike in hatred towards Asian Americans that we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we get a little bit too deep into the project, um, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a visual journalism student here in the School of Individualized Study. Um, I have a really strong interest in news coverage and using different media like photography and video and social media and animations to make stories engaging and easily accessible to everyone. Um, the journalism industry is constantly evolving and I'm really interested in exploring new ways to continue and share stories as both technology and the world as a whole develops. 
So for this project in particular, I really wanted to create one easily accessible consolidated place for information about these incidents to be found um, and to help others kind of understand what's been going on um, within the Asian community in the past year. So yeah. So we're actually gonna start with a quick video. Um, I'm gonna play it and it does have captions. So let's see, I think I can. Okay, that's fine. This coronavirus crisis, Asian American we are back with an unexpected side effect of this coronavirus crisis, Asian Americans becoming targets of discrimination. In the last few days, Chinatown has been quiet as fear takes over the community. It's disturbing and disheartening. An elderly woman is chased by a bully. None stopped the attacker, not one. No one helped the woman. He also made anti-Asian statements telling the woman she didn't belong here. I screamed help, help. And uh, nobody helped me. People there who are watching the situation and nobody did anything. And he never wake up again. I never see Since him again. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have seen an incredibly disturbing increase in the number of hate crimes, racist attacks, and acts of discrimination against Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. <laughs> Asian Americans demand justice. We demand justice. Stop the hate against us. We are not a fucking virus. We just want to have to like not worry about being attacked every time we go outside. Like, I don't think that's too much to ask for. Um, so yeah, so on the website, that is the first um, thing that you see. Um, and I'll scroll through the website a little bit towards the end of my presentation as well. Um, but yeah, so we'll start with a little bit of background about the issue that's been going on, and then we'll look through the actual project itself. Um, so between March of 2020 last year and February 2021, 3,795 hate crimes and racially motivated incidents were recorded by Stop AAPI Hate, um, this is a really significant spike from the 158 hate crimes that were recorded against this community in 2019. It's also important to recognize that this is information that's only gathered by one um, organization. Um, this was the most kind of consolidated information that I could find was through this center. So I haven't gathered all of the information from different police departments and the FBI and things like that. Um, so this, and keep in mind that this is um, from only until this coming, or this year's February. Um, so the information very much has changed since then. Um, and this could also not be all of the information that is out there. Um, hey, the form... Just a moment, we can't see your whole screen. I can't. Oh, really? I can see the top uh, near the search okay. bar, but not the rest. I feel like that's probably important. Okay, thank you. Let me try that again. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Better. Here. Here we go. That's better. Okay. I apologize. Um, let me. I'll just do it this way and then we'll be fast. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, so the four largest types of incidents that are recorded, I split up into these four categories. So the main ones are verbal assaults, um, shunning or avoidance, uh, physical attacks, as well as civil rights discrimination. Um, as you can see, these are the percentages of what those kind of look like. So verbal assaults generally involve things like um, being, yelled, being yelled at, um, racial slurs, being called names, things like that. Um, shunning and avoidance generally means just avoiding someone physically solely on the basis of their external appearance um, of their ethnicity or their race. Physical attacks are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and civil rights discriminations include anything that would um, show another person preventing someone from participating in any sort of activity or receiving any sort of service solely on the basis of their race. Um, it is also important to note that a lot of 
the events that happen are not reported. And there's a couple of different reasons for this. The two main ones that I'm going to talk about are the model minority myth and the language barrier. The model minority myth is a whole other topic that I could do a whole other presentation on. But essentially what it is, is it's a term used to refer to a minority group, in this case, the Asian American community, um, perceived as particularly successful, especially in a manner that contrasts with other minority groups. So generally, the Asian community is kind of upheld to this really high standard because they tend to have really high paying jobs, like um, they become doctors, lawyers, anything like that, um, which makes them look like the successful minority, um, which because of this, um, a lot of people are raised to kind of keep their heads down, not cause any kind of trouble because they are, you know, raised with this kind of um, expectation from the rest of society to kind of, you know, mind your business and, and carry on with your life. Um, the second reason is a language barrier, simple as that. Um, many of the people who have experienced these attacks are elders who don't speak English as their first language, or just any person of any generation who doesn't speak English as their first language, um, and they don't speak it well enough to convey what has happened to them. So that definitely prevents people from reporting as well. So in terms of this project, the biggest question that I had to ask myself when I was working on it was, why? Why am I doing this? Why did I need to make this? Does this site add at all to the conversation about this issue? Which I hope it does. Um, I felt that a lot of the information that has been and is being spread about this issue is through social media. There is general news coverage of it, but the most, um, the most that I've seen in general has been through social media, through a specific age demographic, um, sharing different posts and messages through Instagram, Twitter, anything like that. However, these are generally only effective for about 24 hours at a time and are seen by a very limited audience of people who follow that specific person. So if I don't follow someone on Instagram, I don't know that they're posting about it and I might never know that, you know, this event or this incident has happened. Um, some of the accounts that I've been seeing that regularly post about these incidents are at Asian Feed, Next Shark, and Asians with Attitude. So it's a lot of Asian oriented and um, run Instagram accounts and companies who specifically focus on this type of thing. So with, with regard to the actual deliverable, um, my first step, of course, was the research. For this, I looked at a couple of different databases. The main one that I looked at was this center called Stop AAPI Hate. AAPI stands for Asian American and Pacific Islander. And the center was created around last year specifically so that people who experience these acts of violence and discrimination are able to report them directly. Um, they're able to report in 12 different um, languages, including multiple Asian dialects and English. Um, so yeah, this was the most consolidated um, and statistically accurate uh, report that I've been able to find. So a lot of my work has been based off of that. But I have also looked at other news publications for their statistics that they've gathered, as well as um, police departments, um, et cetera. The process of gathering all this information was pretty time consuming. Um, I looked, like I said, at a bunch of different organizations. And the main way that I consolidated all of this information was into a calendar. So essentially, I did Google searches all the way back to last March, um, just looked everywhere I could and plugged all of the events that happened into a calendar. Um, and then I separated and identified all of these events by categories, I guess. So I separated them into categories and gave them labels such as physical, verbal, um, general offensive behavior, which could mean anybody just kind of being uh, disrespectful towards the community and the culture, um, as well as other significant events. Um, and then I also unfortunately had to label a number of them with injury or death as the outcome. Um, so I kind of noted which ones um, resulted in that income or outcome, excuse me. And now we go on to the deliverable. So like I said, the deliverable was a website. Um, keep in mind, I know absolutely nothing about developing a website. <laughs> so this is a really, really fun process for me because I was able to kind of combine videos and photos that I found and different um, information and statistical information that I found um, into this one thing and also teach myself a lot about coding and building a website. So it was a really, um, beneficial project, I would say, in a number of different ways. So this is the main page that you see. Um, this is Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, so that is the main homepage. You would click this begin button and head to the next page, which starts with the video that I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. Um, this video I did put together myself um, with a bunch of different uh, news clips, as you saw um, from different uh, organizations 
put them together. So you scroll down a bunch of uh, text to read, kind of context about the virus itself, the effect of the pandemic on the world, and then we get into the specific effect of the pandemic on the Asian American community. A um, bunch of different statistics in here as well. About four in 10 US adults say it's more common for people to express racial, racist or racially insensitive views about people who are Asian now than it was before the outbreak. Um, different things like that. And then we get into some of the information that I shared at the beginning. Um, so these are the statistics that I mentioned earlier. Um, as well as 31% of Asian Americans have reported um, interacting with, meaning they were directly the victim of or just saw um, comments and, and social media content that was racist towards Asians specifically, um, more now than they have in the past. We get into some more statistics information. Um, so this is an ethnic breakdown of those who reported um, seeing or being victims of crimes to stop AAPI hate. This is based on the 3,795 that were reported. As you can see, the top demographic that has been targeted are Chinese Americans. But as you can see, there are all kinds of um, dem uh, ethnicities who have been attacked as well. Um, Korean, general Asian, meaning unidentified. Um, someone may not have known what their specific ethnicity was. Um, Vietnamese, Filipino, Japanese, uh, white, Taiwanese, other, Hmong, Thai, Hispanic, Black or African American, and Lao. So these are all ethnicities that were um, targeted during these uh, acts of violence and hatred. We also have the age demographics of victims as well as the sites of discrimination in these pie charts. So ages between zero to 75 plus are all in here. Um, the most common that is reported is um, incidents happening to people between the ages of 26 and 35, in which there were 842. This particular statistic, um, not every incident that was reported uh, had the age of the person who was victimized. So there are less uh, reports to go off of for this one, but that's what I'm going off of based off the information I was able to gather. And then sites, sites of discrimination include businesses, um, a public street or sidewalk, uh, online, in a public park, public transit, private residencies, at school, anywhere else, as well as in a university and place of worship. And then we move on to this map of the United States of America that shows you by state the percentages of um, hate crimes and incidents against Asian Americans that have happened. Um, California has a lot of them, surprisingly, despite how diverse the majority of the state is, with 46.36% of the attacks. Um, but yeah, so this allows you to just roll over each state and see specifically um, what the percentage of those are found in each state. And then we get a little bit more into the rhetoric um, and why um, people are so hesitant to prosecute for hate crimes, because hate crimes are very difficult to prove. Um, get a little bit into the rhetoric, have some tweets that were put up by the previous president of the United States, um, where he uses the terms China virus, Chinese virus, and Chinese plague, um, which his use of that rhetoric um, can, it, the spike in hatred and violence can't solely be blamed on this person, but it definitely did not help, um, definitely contributed. So, and then next we move on to a, if it loads, a full timeline of all of the incidents. Um, this part of the website is still in a developmental stage. Um, so I will be finishing this to my satisfaction um, after today. <laughs> um, but this is basically a pretty in-depth timeline of all of the events that have happened um, starting on March 1st um, of last year and going all the way down until last week. Um, once this is finished, each of these read more pages will take you to a separate page where I basically break down the incident and include like pictures or videos that were captured as well as um, like social media comments. Right now it just takes you directly to an article that talks about the incident. Um, so it's a little bit more cut and dry right now. Um, so yeah, lots of, unfortunately, unfortunately, lots of events to cover here. Um, and every incident where the coronavirus was a specific uh, inspiration, for lack of a better word, for these attacks, um, each of them are noted with an asterisk. Um, so where COVID was a proven or obvious motive, um, they are noted with that asterisk. Um, so yeah, this is basically my entire project. And then we just have like the page about me. Um, and 
then we go back to the beginning and we can read through it all again. So Anna, yeah, that's, <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, I've been told that uh, uh, Nick is using an interpreter and I've been told that the interpreter needs to leave at five. So okay. if it's okay with you, I would like to hold on your portion of the Q&A. Hopefully you can stay until after five. Mm -hmm. And so that we could go right to Nick now so that he has the benefit of the interpreters at least for his presentation. So yeah, I, absolutely. I apologize for that, but I, that's not something that I was expecting. No worries, no worries. Okay, Nick, you're on. Okay. <clears throat> Push this button, this here, and then click this button. I'm assuming you guys can see this, so it's coming up. Let me move this and put this in here. Move. So, um, <laughs> um, my project was focusing on the um, theater. Um, theater, unfortunately, as you know, has been shut down. The industry, unfortunately, has been shut down on a standstill for the past year. Um, you're going on, you're almost you're, you're in a month now. Um, and it's unfortunately put a very big um, hold on a lot of people's lives. So normally working at industry, directors, designers, artists, performers, anything, um, anything in that area, even to what we wouldn't think like um, marketing companies who work with the theaters, who work with them to, to create marketing campaigns for their shows, all that other Nick, you're frozen. Nick, you frozen. Sorry, but I don't know what just happened. Can you see me okay? I can see Anna. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> I can see your screen, but not you. Okay, now I can see you. Can you see me? I can see a picture of you. I can see your photograph, but I can't see you in person. And I can still see your screen. Can you hear me? I can. So if you want to continue, if, if you know, you don't, we don't need to be able to see you if, if uh, I mean, it's better, of course, but if we can hear you and we can see your screen. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. My internet's not being very nice to me. I want this to go well. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna have to do it the old school way, which is manually type everything out, which is fine. Oh, now we can see you in real in real time. Okay, good. <laughs> oh my God, that was embarrassing. Whew. Oh, I hate when that happens. Okay, I'm gonna leave this just chat open in case it fails again. Whew. Okay, I'm gonna keep going and act like that didn't happen. No worries, not embarrassing. <laughs> I don't know how to move from slide to slide. That is embarrassing. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, so. As I was saying, so the arts industry is basically on hold, unfortunately. Um, now a lot of people are working who normally work in that industry. And even if you would think it some um, some company who wouldn't be related to theater, of course, probably has some relationship to it in general. So being the artist that I am in a way, I used to do a lot of acting for a lot of theater companies in the Chicago area, and I used to do a lot of um, 
different different kind of odd jobs here and there, directing, directing, designing, different stuff. So I came up with the idea of, well, how about trying to use RIT's spaces that we have at RIT, RIT's campus to create some kind of maybe variety act type performance. And so while, while I was working with my mentor, I originally came up with one space, which was the Dyer Arts Center over at NCID. But then as I was working to the project, I was like, hmm, what if we um, also did something in the magic spells, the, the sound stage that they have in there, that they mainly use for film and all that stuff. And so the idea prompted me to go, okay, I could use that space to do something more elaborate and something more complicated. Um, and so the idea was inspired by um, sort of like window pop-up performances that, that um, I that uh, my mentor had mentioned that were happening in New York City, that they would do it every like Christmas or whatever, kind of with like the little figures and like the shops and all their stuff. And now that they've been, um, that sort of phenomenon has been sort of transferring itself to theater where you would go and you would walk by and see somebody performing behind a piece of um, glass in some kind of store setting or at a, at a, at a um, maybe at a mall or something like that. So the idea clicked and went, oh, okay, this might be something I could work with. So here's obviously a picture of a Dyer Art Center. And I, when I was working with um, the Dyer Art Center people and talking with them and negotiating and figuring out when would this be possible to do, because I had explained to them at this point, I liked the, I, I would, I like the, would like the idea to be on campus. Unfortunately, as you probably can guess, I'm not on campus. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm over here in Chicago. So I did everything, um, preparation, everything remotely and planning and logistics and all that stuff remotely, which kind of taught me a little bit more about what it means to be a project manager mm -hmm. and how there are some skill sets that I have and some skills that I don't. <laughs> and I think that kind of will change as I get older and go up into the work world with a variety of different um, skills that I need. So I originally started with thinking the dialogue channel. So I was talking to the people and they're like, well, um, this is how much it's gonna cost for how much time you need. And so um, I was like, okay. And so we had worked through that. Then I had also thought of the idea of the Magic Spells Studio. Again, on my picture, I don't know, the internet. Um, but the idea was bigger space, more, um, more technology, more ability to use the space better. If you can see in the magic studio, they do have what we theater people call bands, which are basically just pipes that you can raise and lower lights and scenery from. Um, obviously, they use that more for um, films, for TV, television, that kind of thing. Now, going back to the Dyer Art Center, because that was where my main focus was, and then I kind of shifted to the idea of there was other spaces on campus that we could use was um, for the Dyer Art Center. And I had reached out and they had explained to me and I kind of told them my parameters of what I was thinking, time, rehearsal time, tech, that kind of thing. And they had told me that overall the 120 hours over six weeks, including the tech and the final dress would be about um, $3,600. Um, and so I said, okay. So I mentally put that in my head. And as I started kind of talking um, with my mentor and going back and forth and trying to figure out how would I fund this? And so she had recommended, well, for now, um, we should try and figure out ways to um, look at options where maybe you don't have to necessarily spend too much money, or maybe it's the only thing you're paying for is the rental of the space. And so we started brainstorming different ideas, and you know she had recommended to me to maybe work with um, the president of NCID to try and see if maybe he had the discretionary fund. And so I, I intentioned. I reached out to him and of course, because of the business and everything, I never actually heard back and bullshit from their office. Um, but so the, there are other ways to make this more cost effective or less, less expensive if needed. Um, and so that's kind of the idea was trying to find a way to put cost perspectives in mind and also um, in the process of kind of learning um, about how do, we, how do I put on a performance with maybe not so much of a budget or how do I figure out a way to utilize space that's already there. Um, it was a challenge to kind of work with that space from a design from a design concept. So um, I, as I said earlier, this would be more of a variety act type of thing where you would kind of, people would probably maybe sit down outside the dire center. The idea was you have chairs outside the dire center on the three sides and then the forms would take place in the middle of the space and that's how it would be done. Um, and they had told me that the, I was bumping into some challenges because they told me that if you wanted to do this in the fall when you were back on campus, that's great. And we would love to help you with that. 
the caveat is you wouldn't have the entire art center to use. Unfortunately, because they were having a, the, the time they were having a show, a uh, gallery show. So I was like, okay, that's fine. I can I can make that work. And they said, you know, we'll, we're, we're happy to support you anyway. We need to. You just might have a limited space. So I had to practice that in my own mind. It's a little bit of a setback, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but it wasn't all that bad. And so I had, when I was talking with my mentor, I realized that COVID is bringing people down a lot. And we see a lot of issues of sadness and depression and mental health is on the rise because of COVID. So the theme I thought for the, for the performance or production would be relating to hope and light at the end of the tunnel, that kind of thing. Um, and so I thought it would be kind of working with um, Enchidee's um, director, uh, not director, I'm sorry, dance coordinator, um, Thomas Warfield, having him incorporate a dance piece and working with different um, groups within LIT and also exteriorly. Um, to make this a um, well-rounded idea and, and um, well-rounded um, project. So I went ahead and I just kind of did some basic um, designing, floor designs of what I would like to see in this space. So the little, the little one over here on the um, on this side of the page here is for the, um, for the um, art center specifically. Um, with the idea that it would be kind of taking place in the round, would that work? And so I was like, okay, you know, would that work idealistically? And so I put that together as a template thing that might work for that space. Also, there could just be no stage and literally just actors in the middle of the, between the two doors performing and that's how it's done. The other idea I had with the Magic uh, Spell Studio, since there was so much space in there, you could literally turn, take one side and turned it into a proscenium, and then the other half is where the audience would be. Now, obviously, keeping costs in mind, the um, the idea with the uh, magic spells is not cheap, <laughs> as as I sort of realized in my own um, mind when it comes to why I tend to design things with a very high skilled budget, and um, and so with the Dior Center, I had to think, okay, what can we do that's relatively cheap? And maybe if there's, even though we see a stage, a circle stage, and then maybe there's no stage, maybe it's just kind of like um, um, Shakespeare, maybe bare bones. Like we go back in time, we think about the old globe theater in over there in England, we would think about just kind of bare, um, out in the open, kind of in the middle, and there's no real set. Um, and so I was kind of thinking along the lines that maybe it would just be performed in the um, doorway to go in to the um, art, art gallery if needed. That's all, thank you so much. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. So um, thank you, Nick. I think I've now been told that the interpreter can stay, so that's great. But uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go back to Anna since uh, we left her hanging. And then we'll come back, in the end, we'll come back to you and follow up with a Q&A with regard to your project. So if that's okay with everybody, maybe we can go back to Anna. No problem here. Hello. There you are, okay. Sorry about that, Anna, but these things happen. Totally fine, totally fine. Th thank you for being flexible. Um, again, Meg, I've forgotten. I, I don't know whether it's supposed to be you first or me, but I'll go first. Um, so I think you, you mentioned this, Anna, in your presentation. Um, you, you touched on it anyway. So is this, is the, is the, Discrimination against Asian Americans, did that begin with COVID or has there always been a certain degree and it's just gotten worse? Yeah, so there definitely has always been this kind of like otherization of the Asian community in the United States. It definitely did not start with COVID-19, unfortunately. I hate that I have to say that, but yeah, the kind of discrimination against and yeah, the discrimination against Asian people definitely did not start with COVID, but the pandemic and the origins of the virus in Wuhan, China definitely made it worse in 2020 and 2021. Looking at your time 
line, which was amazing. I, I mean, I can't, you know, you scroll through it very quickly. So I don't know how many uh, individual um, incidents you've recorded, but that, I, I mean, I don't know whether anybody else has done what you've done, but it, it sounded like you've really done an excellent job of chronicling the whole cycle. H have you noticed coming up to the present, is the situation getting worse? Is it flattened out? Or is it, uh, uh, are people not, not, you know, getting, it's not so bad now? Or how is that? Yeah, so it's definitely interesting. Everything seems to have kind of happened in waves. So right when the coronavirus came to the United States, it was really bad. Um, a lot of people calling up to strangers and saying, oh, where's your mask? You have the coronavirus, like you're Chinese, go home, don't spread it to people assuming that because a person is or looks Chinese even that they inherently have it. Um, that subsided a little bit over the summer of last year and over the fall. Definitely were still a lot of incidents um, that were occurring, but definitely kind of slowed down, I guess. And then it resurged again at the beginning of this year. Um, some people, researchers think that this is because it's coming it's it had come up on a year since the pandemic had started and people were kind of realizing that that it hadn't gone away um and we're again um kind of bringing out that animosity against asian people again um so it got pretty bad around february of this year um after being not not such a high volume of instances for the past few months before then what about so, yeah, the it kind of went in waves what about the last month or so? The last month or so, <laughs> um, there haven't been a ton of incidences that were specifically COVID related, which is which is very good. Um, but there there definitely were were still um, you know instances that came up, and some that were some that were physical, um, and some that were online, some that were verbal. Um, there is one particular one that um, showed a a woman on Facebook writing these awful derogatory comments about a two-year-old Chinese girl on Facebook, um, saying these awful things about her and her appearance because she was Chinese, saying that she, you know, things like that, just because she was Chinese. Um, there was a man just last Friday who was brutally beaten and put into a coma by a stranger in New York City. Um, he was an elderly Chinese man. Um, so there's been no clear motive of the pandemic um, for some of these, which is I wanted to be very clear that not all of these were proven to be solely be motivated by anger about the pandemic, um, but the spike in, in animosity towards this community um, as a whole has raised significantly. Um, would, you, would you explain a little bit more, you mentioned a myth, and I forget the name of what you called the myth that, that is sort of set the situation that, that, that already existed, uh, but now got exacerbated by the situation. What, what was that myth again? Mm -hmm. So it's called the model minority myth. Model and minority, okay. Yes, like I said, that's a totally other topic that I a, am not perfectly educated on, and it is a topic that there could be a whole other presentation about. Um, but essentially it is kind of the stereotype that Asians are supposed to be kind of held to this higher standard than other minorities. Um, people can say, oh, well, the Asians have really good jobs. They are lawyers, they're doctors, like, so they're doing really well. Why can't the Black community do it? Or why can't the Hispanics do it? Or anything along those lines. So it's essentially this really harmful stereotype that is perpetuated against the Asian community that kind of holds them to that standard, which also then, again, kind of not necessarily encourages, but kind of um makes people within the community feel like they have to kind of keep their heads down and and be quiet and be docile and be nice and say okay well like chinese people it, filipino people vietnamese people asian people as a whole in the country are generally not known for being loud and for speaking their voices when especially when there are problems like this so that myth in particular is is really harmful with this current situation because Historically, Asian people have been kind of expected to just kind of deal with it. And younger Asian people, particularly in my generation and the millennial generation, are over it and are tired of having to just sit down and be quiet and not stand up for what is being done to their people. 
Okay, last question. So you sure. now have a website that you didn't have before as a result of this project. And, and it's, it's a standalone website? That, that's what the website is? Or have you incorporated it into a, a more of a, of a larger website that's about you and, and what you can do? So right now, just because I already had it, I just built it into my current portfolio website. Okay. Um, so it's, it's like an offshoot of that website that I already own. Um, right. Once, once I figure out all of the copyright stuff, because there are images that I, I used from uh, Getty images and Reuters and the Associated Press. Once I figure out and ensure that I won't be copyright claimed for those things, um, I will create like its own domain and publish it as its own website. Great. Well, congratulations. I thought it was a fantastic project. So thank you. Very well done. Meg. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so Anna, for someone that's never um, designed a website before, um, I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I, I, I know, or I'm, I'm going to assume that you'll share um, the website link with us, um, you know, when you deliver your, your final product. Um, I really want to go back through and look at that timeline, which I thought was really impressive. Um, you referenced, um, you know, in response to a question, how things have spiked and maybe subsided. I wonder, um, did you come to any conclusions um, based on um, this being an election year and approaching November or approaching the inauguration? And did you see any increase in um, offenses you know, around those specific timeframes? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I think that we all can agree that the pandemic as a whole has kind of become a partisan issue. That being said, I don't, I, I haven't seen any sort of particular increase or decrease in violence around particular political events. So like you mentioned around the election, I didn't notice that, were, that there were any more than there had been like the weeks before. Um, what I will say is that given all of the tension surrounding the political world over the last year, around certain, I'm trying to think of like the correct description, around certain like, for example, interviews or things on in the media, um, things kind of spiked then. Um, so for example, with the repetitive use of the term Chinese virus, um, not only did um, Google searches actually um, really increase of people searching up phrases like Chinese virus, Kung flu, things like that. Google searches were at an all time high for the Chinese virus, the, the term Chinese virus in um, like early April of last year. And we can kind of see that that is around the same time that certain events were spiking. Um, so I, I, I think that around certain times where the pandemic in relation to the Asian community is brought back into conversation on a social level, that's kind of when things start to happen in a more high vol of a higher volume and with more frequency. Um, but in terms of actual um, political events, I haven't noticed any sort of trends now. Okay. All right, so that's really interesting. Um, and again, like you mentioned, could probably be um, its whole other project. Um, especially in, in a year that's as loaded as this one is. Um, my next question is, um, in one of the graphs, um, and I loved the different ways that you presented visually um, some of that data, um, I want to say, in, unless I misunderstood, um, that the highest portion of incidents were against individuals around the 24 to 35 range. Was mm -hmm. that correct? So why, yeah. do that, why do you think that is? Um, that, that age range, that actually surprises me. Um, now it, it crossed my mind, maybe, um, those are people that are taking the most risks and so are out the most during a pandemic, um, or, um, you know, I'm not sure maybe older people, like you mentioned, are not reporting those instances. So maybe they report at higher rates. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on why that demographic is so high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think that I think that it comes down to two factors, like you said, um, the demographics of people who are actually doing the reporting, and I think social media also has a huge impact on this as well. Um, people the ages twenty four to thirty six probably are more likely to find resources for reporting these incidents and are therefore more likely to actually do it. Whereas, like I said, elderly people might not um, might not be able to, might not know how to. 
things like that. Um, and then with social media, I think that a lot of the events that are being talked about and that are being easily found and um, learned about are because people are recording them and putting on social media. Um, there are a number of events um, in the timeline that I put um, that were only known about because somebody specifically took pictures or took a video and uploaded it to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, any of the above. Um, so I think that <laughs> that demographic probably is the most likely to record something happening to them and then post it and say, this is not okay, this is what happened to me. Um, again, the information within those specific charts only comes from one center. So it's very likely that the people who are finding that place, that resource to report these incidents are between that demographic. Um, so it could be kind of skewed information, um, but I think that those are the two factors that contribute the most to that. That's great. So interesting. Thank you so much, Anna. I really, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Does anybody else have any questions? I got a question here for you. <laughs> it's a little, sure. it's, it's a little theoretical, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So I'm curious about the connection between um, hate crimes and the overarching idea of brokenness in humanity? I know that's a little bit of a theoretical question the way I ask it. Um, and the reason I'm asking just because I'm curious because um, I've noticed that there's a lot of um, a lot of brokenness in the world, a lot of people who are doing bad things that um, maybe crimes, maybe intentional, unintentional. And it seems like we're kind of going down a not so good path. As a, as a human race. Um, and so I'm curious as to, from your perspective, um, what do you think about my kind of thought on that as to why everything is the way it is? And yeah, curious. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. I think, I think that you're right on that. I think that there is a certain level of, of anger in the world that, I personally haven't experienced, I've only been alive for 22 years, but in that time, I don't know that I've, ex I've seen so much hatred and so much anger coming from so many different people of so many different backgrounds. So, you know, when we see, you know, grown women berating toddlers on social media because of the way their eyes are shaped because of their ethnicity, that has to come from, from a really dark place internally. You know, like when you see someone telling a person to, to go back to where they came from, to go back to their own country, when they've lived in the Bay Area of California their whole lives, that, that comes from a certain place of, of fear and anger and hostility. And I think that that definitely is something that contributes to that. And it, that, that is something that, that really breaks my heart about this whole situation. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's a very valid thought. And I'm, I'm very glad that you brought that up. I'm glad to. <laughs> okay, so now we can go back to Nick for the last segment. Um, and uh, Meg, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I enjoyed your presentation, Nick. Um, I, I'm curious um, what the next step is for you. And I'm wondering, um, it sounded like a, a lot of what you um, <laughs> were doing, maybe are doing, um, revolves around project management a little bit. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering what's next for you and, and are you carrying with you a lot of the skills and competencies that you've learned on this project um, moving forward? So I learned a lot about um, project management. Like I said, I learned a lot about myself too and what I'm capable of doing and what I understand from the industry of, or, sorry, approaching it from the industry that I'm currently going into with my major, which is communications, marketing, advertising, and PR. Um, and so I, my personal struggle when I was working with um, Dr. Aldersley was trying to figure out a way in my own mind to kind of connect the two loves that I have, theater and the major that I'm doing and trying to find a way to make sure that they stick. Um, and so um, when I was kind of practicing the idea for myself, 
I was like, oh, okay, this could be a good advantage for me because I could kind of learn how to product, project manage things a little bit. And that could give me a skill that I could take with me. And regardless of whether I change industries or whether I stay in the industry that my major is. Um, and there was that whole aspect. And I'm like, okay, I've learned, I've learned skills that I can sort of go ahead and put, you know, and use in other assets of my life. Um, and that I consider that a very good thing. Um, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the, the question just so I can make sure I've got the answer out right? No, I, I, I think you actually did. And, and my question was, um, you know, what you plan to do next and maybe how you're going to use some of these skills that you learned and translate them into um, another, another mm -hmm. project for yourself, hopefully full-time employment if you're graduating. <laughs> um, that's that's the goal right that's always the goal to find future work and move on to the next stage of life um but um to answer your second part of your question more directly um i learned a lot about maybe just keeping myself on keeping myself on a task of sort of writing things down putting things in a big ass big spreadsheet making sure i've documented everything that needs to get done and making sure that everything is there so that way when I look at it, I'm not going, oh, did I forget something? <laughs> and so that was one big skill, but I'm gonna take it with me of some just making sure that everything's there, everything organized so I can see what's going on. And luckily, um, previous experiences using project management tools for other internships that I've done have kind of helped me with what with this project and what what I am hoping to do potentially in the future um, with this project or the idea of that. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Of course. Toss it over to you. Um, Nick, I, I was uh, I was shocked that uh, that they were going to charge you all that money to use the Dyer Art Center. I mean, you're a student at NGID. And why why were they going to charge you anything? I mean, it's uh, I just uh, I'm, I think I'm that was a hurdle. That. I think that was another hurdle that I'm that I'm definitely I have already incorporated into the paper as well, but just kind of the realization of because I was kind of expecting it along that way too. And um my mentor Luann was telling me, you know, there's a possibility that they could they might not they might not charge you because you're a student, you're you're essentially a part of the university, you're here, you're not some kind of outsider who's trying to use <laughs> the university facilities. And so it was a little bit of a road back and a little bit of a surprise to say, Oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to charge you, we're gonna have to give you a rental. I'm like Okay, and it just as I was going through the process, it was kind of a hurdle. Of, um, I would love to see it realized, but there was a budgetary issue that comes into play at where do I get the money for just even to rent the space is, is the issue. And just that that kind of was a little bit a little bit of a hurdle of going, okay, now I have to kind of step back a little bit and go, okay, who do I contact? Because when I was having those conversations with Luann, it's going, who do I contact try? Just get a general idea of budgetary, how do I do that? And she's like, she recommended that I um, try and reach out to different clubs because they didn't do anything last year because of the pandemic. They didn't host any events, and to try and try and approach it from their um, from their aspect, working with um, with um, us at NCID, she had told me that unfortunately at this point they wouldn't be able to give any kind of money, but they would be willing to support the idea by giving props or chairs or anything I needed from a physical standpoint to make the production um, look. <laughs> somewhat somewhat um nice and somewhat not bare bones um and so that was what they were telling me that they would be able to contribute um and i did reach out to some clubs and unfortunately i never really heard back and i don't necessarily blame them because everyone's busy with school it's the middle of a pandemic and everyone's kind of just trying to stay in their lane of okay let me get the school done let me do this let me do that and kind of just and maybe in a way I've kind of realized that maybe this wasn't the best time to do a project like that just because of the pandemic being there. And it was it was a good idea and it still was a good idea in terms of working with limitations that are kind of put on you a little bit and trying to make the best out of the situation as best as possible. Um, and so for me, I kind of learned that a little bit just kind of in my mind, like, you know, well, you know, in, in the future, if I was to do this again, I would do a semi, of course, not pandemic era and maybe I would still incorporate some ideas of a pop-up event maybe in that type of setting where it's kind of maybe um playing with the idea of a um space that's not really used for theater 
but you use it for that space and you transform that space to the need. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that was my question. So I, I'm not clear about what all, what the components of the production that you wanted to make. You mentioned dance with Thomas Warfield and you mentioned pop-up, the sorts of things that, you know, when you're walking through, uh, I don't know, uh, Times Square, you, and you mentioned the, the stores with with, mm -hmm. with uh, act, actors doing whatever they do to attract customers. So, what what tell, talk more about what you wanted to produce? So the so the overarching idea was some kind of performance in some kind of space that wasn't a traditional theater. Because of the restrictions of COVID, we couldn't really put anyone in a theater safely. Well, we could have, but. And your local logistical households of, oh, are they vaccinated? Or oh, are they this? Or are they willing to sit in a theater and wear a mask? And so there was that kind of issue um, on, that was kind of put, put in the situation. And so um, the idealistically, what would have been really interesting and dreaming big here when I, when I was talking to the land was if I had um, the budgetary means and the people who are willing to, to support the idea was to um, turn the Dyer Art Center or even the uh, Magic Book Studio into a full-on um, theatrical space. Utilizing the space is a little bit, but the idea originally had was, what about we, instead of a variety act, what about a play or a musical? And take, put it into that space and build a set that rises into the building. And the idea would be kind of that you would walk through um, the show. Like the actors would perform one scene by one area of the, of the center, or kind of same thing, one like spot in the magic box. So you kind of see them perform that piece, then you kind of walk and um, see the next thing. I know that um, the, the idea that kind of popped up for me was kind of similar to like when they do, they recently been doing it with the COVID, like with Halloween. <laughs> they would do kind of the the, um, the haunted trail, we would walk and they would tell you stories of that, that kind of, that's where the idea kind of stemmed from, the idea of sort of a walk and see kind of performance type of thing. And so idealistically, my first, response to her was, I want to do a play, I want to do a music, I want something big, and something expected, and she's like, she looked at me, she's very nice, she's like, I don't know if that would work out, and so I was like, okay, and so we kind of settled on the idea of a one act where you can um, still incorporate the idea of big, beautiful performances, and, that, and that's how I was kind of like, well, what if we incorporated dance and work with, with Thomas Warfield, um, what if we um, work with some of the, like, the orchestra groups on campus, maybe even bringing some students in from Eastman, like bringing, putting a whole big thing together um, to kind of reignite or spark the idea that the arts is still alive and it's not dead <laughs> um, and not really dormant. So um, mm -hmm. is this, a, is this, so you, you, you know, you, you ran into a, a basically a financial problem as much as a COVID problem. So uh, is this something that you're going to continue to to work at or or uh, is this are you done with this now? I'm going to I'm going to try and continue working with it as best I can. I know I'm stuck at the return to campus in the fall, which I'm much looking forward to. I'm tired of being in, at home and seeing the four walls of my room. <laughs> um, so I'm definitely hoping to return to campus and, and to some extent try and bring some version of it realized on campus. Um, that, that's the goal. That's what originally I had said I would try and do this semester. And because of financial pro logistics and timing logistics, and since I wasn't there, it's kind of hard for me to be in. I felt like I wanted to be there because I could work with, you know, um, the people who were going to be working with me, work with the students, work with the um, people. And essentially the idea was I would get um, NCIDs because they have a shop, uh, a scenic shop to help me build the fundamental things I would need. Um, that was the idea, but of course I had to step back a lot and just go, okay, we're going to have to just approach at this point as a theoretical for right now, as a, um, as a hope to right now. And so if I kind of did the research, I asked the dialogue center, what's, you know, what's, what am I, what is there, um, how much, what, is it? can I use the space free? They said, I'm sorry, no, we have to rent it to you. And so there was some of those, you know, I wouldn't call them hiccups, but I guess things that I probably didn't process at the time and um, or maybe wasn't expecting, um, at least with the financial aspect. I was kind of expecting that the COVID thing was going to be in the way and present a problem. And I was concerned, um, not anymore, um, but I was concerned in the beginning that this would not come to fruition just because the COVID restrictions uh, in New York might get 
tighter and tighter and tighter and then camp to eventually be forced to um shut down or whatever so so yeah. so you know um yeah. like we we say to 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 all students i guess but it, it comes out more with some you know the point of the course is to encounter new challenges to learn how to deal with that with those challenges sometimes the challenges are, are massive and totally unexpected sometimes they you know you can find a workaround so you know even though you didn't actually get to do everything you wanted to do it still sounds like you you've learned a lot about the process of trying to put um, uh, a performance you know to make it to realize a performance so so that so i think that in that sense you succeeded in any case uh, uh I, I we're way over we're this is uh, a record now, five, uh, an hour and 24 minutes. So <laughs> we should be getting better at this, but actually we seem to be getting worse. Um, so thank you. Thank you all three of you, uh, uh, Maddie and Anna and Nick, uh, great presentations. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, listening to them. And now it remains for me to remind you and you to do the two papers that we will uh, hope to see in a couple of weeks and then you'll be done. And uh, Sounds like Nick isn't uh, ready to graduate. I don't know about you, Anna and Maddie. I think you said you were graduating, but in any case, you're all close to the end. So uh, my best wishes, and um, I'm sure you're gonna go out into the world and uh, you're gonna uh, do a great thing. So for now, thank you very much. Meg? Great work, everybody. Thanks, Stephen. Great work, everyone. Um, you're so close to the finish line, if, if not fully to be done at RIT, at least for the semester. Um, so stay safe and, um, and hang in there. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. You're going to stay.